today I'm going to be talking about a project that I started before my graduate career started, and it's called Our Collective Fabric, the Microbiome, Demystifying Science with Socially Engaged Art Practices. The Collective is a collaborative group of artists and scientists, Floor, Sarah, Nahal, Sofio, and me. In our last iteration of our experience, we asked our participants what they thought of the microbiome before they started growing their own kits and their own microbic fabrics. And these were some of the answers. Enemy, stressful, abusive, anxiety, unhealthy. What is the microbiome? It's a collection of organisms that live on and inside of you. They include bacteria, protists, fungi, parasites, viruses. They aren't necessarily something you need to be afraid of. You're actually all made up of them right? So there are more microbes in our body than our own cells. And they live all over us, including our mouth, our digestive system, our skin. And more oftentimes than not, it's a symbiotic relationship where we help each other out. Our collective fabric or OCF's goal is to create an experience that opens a dialogue between scientists, artists, and the public. We want to make science accessible both literally because science labs are usually restricted areas and materials we provide are usually meant for scientific institutions, not for individuals to buy from the store. But also we wanted to create a socially engaged art experience where the general non-science public can tap into their artistic side while utilizing the scientific method to grow bacteria outside of the traditional lab setting. We wanted to use the microbiome as a metaphor to showcase the benefit of a biological and socially diverse community. The OCF experience is very adaptable and has changed with the needs of the time. The first iteration was done by Floor at an exhibition, part of the Civic Art Lab in 2019 at Chinatown Soup, where people were welcome to streak a large collective plate with all the participants came in and streaked their own microbes onto the same plate, whether they're friends, strangers, whatever, they all were on the same plate. And the exhibition was open for the next two weeks for people to come in and watch this bacterial plate grow. Then the pandemic hit and everything was shut down. So we took the experience virtual, where we would talk to different communities like that of the art world, as well as medical professionals at the Mayo Clinic about using socially engaged practices to explain scientific concepts. So we started creating take-home kits, essentially Essentially, the lab was now coming into your home where you could take your own samples from your body and then treat it on a plate and watch it grow in the comfort of your home. And then you can upload your responses and your documentation of this growth over time online. So it was very accessible and now more people could do it instead of coming into our lab space or into a classroom. Well, OCF has gone a step further where now people are creating art as a response to the experience. These are samples from Floor Social Practice Art Education class at Queens College where her students are art teachers and they went through this OCF experience of using the kids and as a response created their own art. Here is our protocol. We start with creating a map and the map is basically the design you will streak your sample onto the plate for it to grow. So you can go wild with whatever you want to collect your specimen for. You can swab any part of your body, your friend's body, your dog's body, like whoever you want, whatever you want. Here is a large collective plate that we made where everyone mapped out their designs and streaked their microbes. And as you can see, the plate has become sort of like a canvas where our diverse microbes of all sizes, shapes, colors, textures are growing harmoniously with another. It's truly a piece of art. It illustrates how a diverse community can grow and thrive in a symbiotic relationship. We took a poll in our experience after it was done and we asked them the same question again. What is your relationship to your microbiome? And the responses were completely different. People were sharing positive experiences of how fascinating it was to watch the bacteria grow and how in many homes it was a conversation starter. This one kid in the class said how he was trying to grow these microbial plates and his mom threw it in the trash because she was like, there's something weird growing on it. Like this got to go. And he went into the garbage, digged it out, and then showed his mom like, hey, I grew this on purpose. These are microbes that were from my body. These are perfectly fine. And this created a conversation that otherwise never would have happened. So it's creating new experiences and creating a stronger connection with people, not only with their own microbiome, but with each other. When we brought this experience into the classroom, it was literally right after school started opening up after the pandemic. And a lot of these students didn't speak up much. And so when we started the experience, no one was talking. It was only after the two weeks when we asked them again that these responses spontaneously started popping up. This is not just about making the plates, but this creating conversation that we didn't know was going to happen per se, but we now want to cultivate that type of conversation. So it's not about doing it empirically, it's more about a conversation that we'd like everyone to be a part of. 
1987 photograph taken by Frank L. Stewart, choreographer Alvin Illy, and visual artist Romar Bearden are shown standing side by side. From the point the two were introduced in 1975 until Illy's death in 1989, numerous collaborations between them would occur, including those between Bearden and other choreographers of Illy's company, the Alvin Illy American Dance Theater, and I'll shorten that to Triple ADT. At Ailey's suggestion, choreographer Diane McIntyre commissioned Bearden to design costumes and scrim for the 1977 Triple ADT work Ancestral Voices. Bearden took an instant liking to McIntyre, fully immersing himself in the compositional experience. During his design process, Bearden would often be found sitting in on rehearsals, asking questions about artistic direction, and even watching the musicians while they played pieces configured by American pianist Cecil Taylor. Bearden continued to collaborate with the Triple ADT well into the 1980s. In one instance, choreographer Tally Beatty asked Bearden to contribute art to serve as the backdrop for his 1982 work Stack Up. The work, meant to be an ode to 1970s Los Angeles, included a mashup of several different dance styles such as ballet, jazz, and vernacular dance. Bearden's resulting backdrop, entitled Under the Bridge, swaps large swaths of bright color for a night scene that, in combination with its relatively low lighting, casts the accompanying city structures in a shroud of darker hues. Despite its darker mood, signs of city life vibrantly pulsate in the bright lights of the skyscraper windows. This universal hum was only amplified by the staccato movement of the dancers. In attempting to replicate this street-derived rhythm, Bearden stretches his artistic bounds, Bearden's collages during this period evolved from his earlier style, influenced by a myriad of sources such as Cubism, Abstract Expressionism, the arts of Africa, and dance, Bearden gradually increased his use of painted elements. The resulting mixed media collages have more fluid figures, as if the viewer were actively watching them in motion. Take, for example, Untitled Mecklenburg Morning from 1978. Here, Bearden constructs a scene of everyday Southern life, which was a common theme in his work, but innovates it by exploring the limits of mixed media. In this memory, Bearden has applied watercolor to make the composition almost illegible, perhaps an allusion to the slippages between reality and memory. Another major theme in Bearden's work is the jazz scene. The artist's studio, which was located above the Apollo Theater on 125th Street in Harlem, would regularly have been filled with the music that played below. Bearden became fascinated with depicting jazz culture. Take, for instance, Jammin' at the Savoy, which the artist completed in 1982. Here, the artist has depicted a jazz performance in full swing at the legendary dance hall on Lenox Avenue in Harlem. Bearden combines painted elements, paper cutouts, and photographs to create his composition. Every musician holds angular momentum appropriate to the instrument that they wield. Fluid, explosive expressions allow Bearden to supplement his visual experiences with the sonic. Both Untitled and Jammin' at the Savoy are brimming with movement. I suggest that they, along with the other pieces that Bearden created during this period, can be viewed as metakinetic representations of his experiences in the studio and theater. Succinctly identified and theorized by John Martin in 1993, metakinesis is the embodied reaction that occurs when one body perceives another body in motion. In visual art circles, metakinesis has been taken up as the idea that artists can draw upon their embodied experiences of dance and translate that into visual strategies. Recent scholarship from psychology and neuroscience has supported the notion that viewers of dance experience a kind of kinetic transference that engages embodied processes. Viewing dance, in other words, kickstarts a series of rapid fire synapse connections along a multitude of sensory channels, which, in the case of visual artists, can spur the creation of works of art. In instances of collaborative artist-choreographer relationships, both groups tend to express greater vitality by moving towards abstraction, as there is no direct translation from one form to the other. This concept of metakinetic transfer has been applied to many visual artists across the 20th century who have turned to the subject of dance to answer some of modernity's most prescient questions. In the case of Bearden's works during this period, I suggest that they are a result of intermedial metakinetic transference. One, it provides evidence of Bearden's return to abstraction, and two, it highlights dance as an integral part of the collective memory from which Bearden works. Across both multimodal works, Bearden marks a turn to his abstract expressionist roots, perhaps a nod to his metakinetic experiences with dance. The artist, in dialogue with these cultural producers, traversed an intermedial terrain. In this cross-disciplinary liminal space, Bearden was able to innovate his own visual practices offstage. 
As a result of his collaboration with Illy and his company, Bearden's representations of the figure were able to express greater dynamism and mobility, incorporating mixed media such as watercolor and paint. In addition to his archival collaged photographs, Bearden gave his figures of this period a greater vitality. In doing so, he demonstrates the outcome of his exploration of the relationship between artistic materials and motion. The artist collaborations demonstrate not only evidence of the intermedial metakinetic transference across and between artistic bodies, but also the lasting creative potential long after such collaboration ends. British artist Peter Snow's 1954 painting, Oiopolis, is a dizzying grid of intricate structures, though they recall the solid monumentality of skyscrapers are porous and transparent. Snow plays with abstraction, disorienting the viewer by creating legible spatial recession, but then immediately dissolving the tangibility of the structures. Yet in this non-figurative image, Snow included a small contextual symbol, a scallop shell perched jauntily inside a small open square on the center left. The contoured shell stands out, catching the eye lost in the expanse of geometric abstraction. The shell, which we can assume was rendered in bright yellow, would spur recognition in the mid-century viewer, just as it would today. It is the logo of Shell Oil. With this knowledge, we see the scene differently. Instead of an abstract investigation of line, light, and depth, Snow based his image on a real-world scene, the array of pipes around an oil refinery. His composition uses the pattern of the pipes to fill the canvas, denuding the scene of infrastructural detail to increase its mystery and monumentality. Its intangibility aligns with the abstract power of oil itself. The method of the painting, despite its modernist idiom, remains intimately tied to extractive infrastructure. Snow, a recent graduate of London's Slade School, was one of 35 young British artists commissioned by Shell to make work based on UK petroleum infrastructure for the 1955 exhibition whose cover you see here, The Artist's View of an Industry. The show began in London and traveled to cities including Leeds, Cape Town, Brussels, and Tokyo under Shell's auspices. It was an early and consequential expression of the mutual influence of art and extractive industry, and its goal and structures, as well as the controversies that it invited, anticipated debates around patronage, documentation, and environmental impact that still inform our consideration of art's potential to challenge or enable extractive industry. While the inclusion of diverse modern styles was an intimation of visual freedom, rather than demonstrating artistic subjectivity, the promotion of abstract works offered a formal apparatus for obscuring the human and environmental impact of petroleum production. Beginning in the 1920s, Shell commissioned a group of prominent British artists to create posters for an advertising campaign. These large posters traversed the nation on oil trucks in environmentalist format, Shell emphasized, to protect the landscape from unsightly billboards. The physical and visual violence of extractive industry was wrought elsewhere. While during the interwar heyday of the Shell poster campaign, most of British petroleum was sourced from sites like Sumatra and Baku that you see in these photographs, World War II prompted the nation to look more seriously at the potential for domestic drilling. Oil wells were sunk in scenic sites like Sherwood Forest and the Jurassic Coast. This trend continued in the post-war period. Shell had, by this point, also shifted its representational approach to normalize industrial infrastructure in images of the domestic sphere. When the artist of an industry opened in London in 1955, the organizers emphasized its distinction from advertising ventures. The exhibition space was a gallery rather than a truck. The works were framed paintings rather than paper posters. Shell's commission was, the catalog emphasized, without constraint, requiring only the oil industry as subject. Journalist Ian Hamilton wrote in the introduction, their artistic conscience was in no danger from the outside at any rate. Indeed, the varied subjects recorded in the catalog seem to attest to artistic freedom, pop gardens in Shell's agricultural center, workers crouched over an air compressor, and an oil tanker in a canal. Yet the images are strikingly repetitive. The scenes of the refineries, distillation units, chimneys, pipes, and gas storage tanks are mostly unpeopled, and the artist concentrated on the dramatic shifts and turns of the pipes, the bulbous shapes of the tanks, and the alien quality of the refinery landscapes. The exhibition leaves the impression, the Times noted, that pipes in every possible convolution were the set subject. Even human figures rarely appear in this wilderness of metal forms. Some of the more experimental compositions animated machinery through the sinuous movement of the pipes, the curving side of the tanker, or the corporeality of a steel engine. Rather than the inert, almost architectural style of other compositions, these presented refinery infrastructure as organic elements, free from human intervention. 
They were, one critic wrote, an imaginative example of modern realism. While the so-called imaginative paintings were different from the documentary style of more conventional realist imagery, they were still legible. They may render lip service to the abstractionist faith, the critic continued, but no doubt would be easily recognized by any refinery worker as a good enough representation of part of his daily surroundings. What then of the five fully abstract paintings that were included in the exhibition? The abstract compositions represented the vastness, frenzied movement, and constant metamorphosis of the landscapes, products, and infrastructure of the oil business. The monumental industrial drama resisted the confinement of the realist image, which only showed the infrastructure that contained this powerful substance. Artworks like Oiopolis and Liquid Constellation depicted oil's futuristic power by manipulating and expanding the visual syntax of the refinery, the twisted pipes, machines, and buildings. But these elements exaggerated and cut off from actual refinery processes or laboring figures lost any practical connotations. The lack of people incensed Marxist critic John Berger, as he wrote in a review of the show, quote, the artist's unfamiliarity with their subject matter may explain the low standard of the works, but what is so significant is the desolately mechanical and inhuman aspect of the show. The non-figurative paintings confirmed Shell's vision of a fully industrial system of energy production that functioned outside the bounds of geological formation and human labor. The more incomprehensible the scene, the less it related to the environmental problems of oil extraction, the refineries rising over the Thames, the volatile chemicals, the drilling apparatuses, and foreign oil fields. It was from outside of Britain that the most significant resistance to this corporate vision of art production came from the Letterist International in Brussels in 1956. They drafted a pamphlet entitled Toutes ces dames au salon, roughly translated to all the horrors of the salon. This exhibition, they wrote, renders the artist's last feeling of revolt anemic. Already, one can see a painting of the so-called non-figurative type, which is perfectly abstract, with the exception of the single word, shell, clearly legible, precise, repugnant as a canker. The exhibition gave the illusion of stylistic freedom, but ultimately coerced the artist the central tenant of the show, that purpose and content, and therefore integration into an industrial system, was necessary for the modern art object. Though the catalog claimed the show did not compromise artistic integrity from the outside, this protest implied that it was even worse. It compromised artistic integrity from the inside. A technological specter recurs in testimonies following October 2nd, 1968, the day the Mexican government opened fire toward civilian protesters at the Plaza de las Tres Culturas. Details vary, but witnesses recount a single or pair of helicopters above the crowd, and the green and red flares drop by them as a signal to begin shooting. The military units fired machine guns from above while soldiers and common clothes paramilitaries shot from the square's perimeter. Thirty years later, as demonstrators marched in protest of the government's continued censorship of the massacre, a lone helicopter circled above their procession. What had three decades prior initiated violence returned to the scene as an uneasy presence, again a witness from the sky. The helicopter has become an omnipresent urban prop, a technology of leisure and violence, and also a tool for artists who toy with and navigate it as a means and symbol of spectacle, mobility, and control. 1968 offers a critical juncture at which the helicopter's associations with militarized violence and control became markedly more visible. But in my research, I looked to case studies before and after. As a sum, these produce not a horizontal lineage, but rather a constellation tethered by a technological apparatus that has fundamentally shaped and perceived Mexico City. This associative approach considers how a specific technology can operate as material, iconography, tool, process, weapon, and a cultural production alike. Aerial perspective has played a critical role in Mexico City's development since the early 20th century, helping to document and justify spatial planning. In the 1920s, the Department of Military Aeronautics produced and disseminated aerial maps of the city for study and public exhibition, and architectural magazines advocated creating topographic maps using scale photographs, making bird's eye imaging central to urban discourse while partaking in a legacy of prioritizing data from above to that on the ground. The first to land on a Mexico City rooftop was in 1948 during a trial for a short-lived postal program. But it was the 50s and 60s that saw a radical expansion in application. The devices used for infrastructural installation, crop spraying, oil exploration, government operations, and official transport. 
In 1971, the police established the Condor Group, deploying two helicopters to crisscross Mexico City each day in a show of the state's aerial power. The helicopter was not used for the earliest bird's eye imaging, but it offers critical advantages for mobility, perspective, and artistic use value. These characteristics include the ability to ascend and descend with total verticality, thus to lift and land in dense urban sites, to hover in place and quickly change direction, to operate in lower sky, and to produce a low oblique angle that displaces the horizon line as a point of stabilization. This ability to abstract and distort has been considered by artists who alternately employ, critique, and puncture the technology and its unique capabilities. A recent example is Spiral City, a collection of aerial recordings of Mexico City and translations of them in painting, photography, and film by British-born and Mexico City-based artist Melanie Smith. Spiral City renders a composite portrait of the city inflected by legacies of surveillance and poverty tourism. Today, I will focus on a contemporary counterpart that, rather than reify and replicate, deconstructs and demystifies a helicopter, Orozco's 2005 Helicoptero. Orozco uses a point-and-shoot camera, preferring relatively simple technologies. Here, he depicts the helicopter, its own kind of point-and-shoot device, as a technology reduced to the point of obsolescence. A wheelbarrow splotched by rust, dirt, and moss is flipped belly up with three wood planks resting upon each other and on the leg support, splayed such that they produce the effect of a blade stilled in a single frame. The matter-of-factness of the title at once conjures and deflates the helicopter by insisting on it as a recognizable iconography while denying its function, rendering not only an impossible flying device, but demobilizing its central component, a wheelbarrow, by inverting this agricultural technology and hampering its own intended action. Historically linked to a godlike vantage, and in Mexico City looming overhead as a daily reminder of military presence, here the helicopter is resolutely grounded, Orozco and his lens taking the dominant position. Helicoptero transforms an object of mobility, power, and dominance into a flightless and doubly useless mass animated by quotidian speculation. If Orozco deflates the helicopter to comic effect, elsewhere its likeness in Mexico City is called upon as a symbol of virility and power. A series of billboards from the early 2010s emphasize the machine as one of law and order. A triptych shows a male officer in heavy protective gear gripping a machine gun, a female officer in everyday uniform, and at center, a cascade of abstracted rope liners. The highest element of the 20-meter tall billboard is a helicopter, a looming reminder of the police's top-down control. My research attunes to the particular ways this device has informed the perception and representation of the city for more than half a century, and how this power and the object itself has increasingly been investigated and used by artists as a tool, a symbol, and an object of critique. The helicopter has been weaponized, deflated, destroyed, commercialized, and iconized, a variously experienced and socially embedded technology that continues to define the city and be defined by those within it. Recent breakthroughs in generative AI have impacted our daily lives and media landscape. The analog reproduction of media content has been disrupted and surpassed by the acceleration of digital files within computational networks across the globe. The outspoken promise of the latest technological advances is advertised as follows. Through the process of machine learning based upscaling and enhancing the degradation through compression of poor images of sound files can be reversed, restored or recovered. But this process induces AI noise, which adds mostly unrelated or speculative data in an unpredictable process. As Walter Benjamin professes in 1935, in principle, a work of art has always been reproducible. Man-made artifacts could always be imitated by man. Replicas were made by pupils in practice of their craft, by masters for diffusing their works, and finally by third parties in the pursuit of gain. The technological reproduction of a work of art, however, represents something new. With the advent of digital technologies, unlimited multiplications of media files, and the recent spread of AI tools, another distinctly new phase for art production, distribution, and consumption must be addressed. Hito Steyer has concluded, Poor images are poor because they are not assigned any value within the class society of images. Their status as illicit 
or degraded grants them exemption from its criteria. The lack of resolution attests to their appropriation and displacement. Apparently, we can overcome this with AI. Degraded qualities can be enhanced. Missing resolution can be recovered. And when degradation is reversed, value can be regained or even added. The following example shows three photographs, the low-resolution original, accompanied with AI upscaled renderings, one of which additionally implementing a phase recovery model. The speculative additions in the middle picture appear to have compromised the optical perspective and sense of depth. The right image seems enhanced at first, but when zooming in closer, the similarity to the original is almost lost, while the middle image diverges drastically. The machine learning filter Studio Sound by Descript promises a clean podcast audio fidelity without exposing background noises or cheap room acoustics to the listener. After the original has played, the studio sound filtration follows. The important task. This is 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 the inclusive choice. Although one can attest to a certain enhancement in all examples, induced disturbances exert novel qualities and contaminate the media object. I will refer to these phenomena as AI noise. In meaning, induced by seats and temperature and caused by frame interpolation. The prompt goes, two girls, Mona and Lisa, are having a cup of coffee. The clear confusion of the given names with the painting title can be seen throughout. The following video displays a still frame from a free second video on the given prompt, which is then upscaled with face recovery based on three different seeds. Nuances in the algorithmic degree of randomness or probability distribution generate a sequence of almost coherent images, although with a strong contamination of AI noise. The amount of randomization is referred to as temperature. Similarly, AI frame interpolation induces a novel logic of motion and object trajectories, which can be seen in the next two video examples. But why call it AI noise and not AI distortion? Because the processes are adding more information, which apparently enhances the quality, yet is speculative or even wrong in context and meaning. And what happens when AI noise is aestheticized? The next series of images displays several AI colorizations which fail to recover the blue of the sky or even fail to keep the blue sky blue. Apparently, the software customers demand a degraded and aged version of the black and white photograph when colorized. This might be explained by the commercially driven machine learning algorithms which deliver the implemented expectation of how the past should look from the perspective of today. AI noise is relevant, but not as expected. Nostalgia can be understood as a commodity which drives the aesthetics of the algorithm. AI noise and the perception of it can be stimulating in various creative domains and thus contribute to AI proficiency. Autoacoustic emissions are the amplification of the cochlea itself in your ear. I say here in the musical setting, it's the product of the ear being amplified and not exactly the audio from the speakers, but that's even in a non-musical setting. There's several different types of OEs. The ones we're specifically most interested in being spontaneous and especially evoked OEs, where I'm working 
specifically is the distortion product using pairs of tones or several tones stacked together. In science and medicine, primarily used for hearing tests, diagnosing vertigo, tinnitus to a growing extent, but not a lot. And then interestingly, like autotoxicity monitoring for like pharmaceutical drugs and their effect on your hearing. They will put these little blue earbuds right in your ear and emit the tone and then measure the amplification of the kickback of your cochlea which would indicate physically hearing the sound that's being emitted into your ear. So again, autoacoustic emissions, they're not the sound itself, but they're the artifact of your ear making the sound. I became interested in this as I was building a synthesizer. And when you build circuitry, it's not always, at least in my situation, it's not always exactly what you plan. There's weirdness, there's artifacts. And in my music and exploration of sound have always sort of leaned into that, those happy accidents. So my goal of this presentation and ultimately this little research track is to kind of create a guide for musicians because there's not a lot of documentation in the arts world, how to construct them or how to use them or references. It's a lot of scientific documentation, which I'm not so much trying to do. So they're produced on speakers versus probes. You take a simple waveform, say a sine tone, stack several sine tones together, and you can detune them or filter them. You could phase them and then sequencing for like musical effect. And I found this diagram to maybe be most reflective of that. I achieved this through hardware means, like I said, and then software means. And I'd like to play an excerpt. Hopefully that came through. It's stacking, detuning, phasing, and sequencing. So I was building a Buchla synthesizer. So I used a ring modulator and a phase shifter for the source and also a sine and sawtooth oscillator, wave generator. And then the delay unit on the left to delay the signal and stack it on itself. So that was kind of a phasing plus. And I used a filter to feedback. And this is where... You can leverage feedback, not really amplify, but make the signal itself much more powerful. You stand to maximize the effect of this. In software, I made a rainbow patch that reflects the same kind of behaviors, especially with the filter and the waveforms and the phasing, the phase shifting. This is where it really started for me when I was building plugins for weird effects like frequency shifters and things. I think this is a really interesting gateway to a deeper exploration of sound. Robert Erickson, who is a 20th century composer out West, wrote a great book about timbre and music. And I always think about just like, how can we get new sounds? The more I deal with this coming from instrumental composition out of computer music is just digging to the lower and lower level to the structures of sound, getting now into like the sample level. And I really feel like coupled with other musical mechanisms, it could be a great way to just blending acoustic instruments with this or different spaces, it's especially installation work using the space itself as sort of feedback and delay where that's appropriate. So these are all things I'm proposing for different festivals, conferences, and, and the like. And also new instruments, new tools, new plugins. I'm always into like expanding that world. And you can't end this without mentioning some notable composers. Marianne Amiche, probably the most famous to leverage this technique. Phil Niblock has a great piece, 3 to 7 to 196 for solo cello and electronic set leverages this and Jacob Kickergaard, this is a newer piece which is absolutely fantastic 
I think for 2013. And then my piece, Auditonia Number no. 1, just heard the excerpt. It's about a 15-minute piece that I premiered last spring. And I mentioned all these documentations, installations, and more concert pieces when I can get to it. We have been experiencing a lot of AI developments recently. I generate those by the chat GPTs. So that is a prompt I input, and then that's the output I have. This is uh, the development of the generative models. The basic idea is quite simple. It compresses the image, what we are seeing right now, into latent space. And that's why with improvements of models, the images start to get more similar. So that's the basic idea of all the AI stuff. For stable diffusion model, what's like we're experimenting a lot right now, it's a similar idea. You have inputs and then you add the noise into the model and then try to reverse the noise and try to denoise that, recover the original image from the noise. They are actually quite different models. Text prompt, image to image, in painting and control net. So the text has a lot of influence of what model going to generate. The other one is image to image. For image to image, we don't start from the noise. We actually start from image. And also here is what we did with the in-painting. So in-painting, you got trend image, but you have an additional channel of the mask and you try to recover that based on the text of prompt. This is part of using the control net. We try to maintain the structure of the building inputs. And also we could have the lightning controls by having the combination of the image to image and also the control net. We have the original image and we can mask it with a different lighting source and produce an image based on the combination of those two images. And we can also help with participatory design tools. We can have communities and actual users to help with reimagining their neighborhood by mask and drawing. Additional one is interactive design. We make different drawings and based on that, we have different text to produce the image based on the painting we have. Here are quite a lot of limitations of the current tools. What he could do is that it's really good at great prototype, but it's something might not be good enough. We can turn an idea into a draft quite quickly, produce a all right, acceptable result, but you won't be able to refine it. It's really hard to control the desired result. You can have a very detailed text, but still might not be what you would imagine. There are distortions. For example, this is a replaced street with a brick sidewalk. The model is not smart enough really to learn those details. So there are quite a lot of possible improvements. We surveyed different types of techniques for model generations. It can help with the pottery process, but it's more on the initial stage. I work at the intersection of visual and audio art and philosophy of mind. I'm particularly interested in the relationship between our perceptual awareness of art and our emotional reaction to art. I focus on the formal elements, color, shapes, size, or pitch, duration, and tone. I believe that by better understanding the formal aspects of art that elicit our attention and emotions, we can start to develop an understanding of how everyday objects and sounds in space contain aesthetic qualities. The spaces in which we live our daily lives contain objects and sounds that mimic artistic formal qualities of artworks. For instance, in my research on sound, I'm not concerned with musical sound or verbal language, Rather, what I want to better understand is the phenomenology of all of the other sounds we encounter in our environment. Sounds like the humming of a machine, bells and dings on buttons, footsteps. Recently, I have been focusing on the study of the phenomenology of everyday sound. This is a study of what it is like for us to experience sound out in the world and conceptualize it. I became interested in sound while working on the philosophy of film techniques. I thought there was something particularly unique about the technique of Foley. This is the film technique of recreating the sound of objects on screen in order to make the object more apparent to the audience. In filmmaking, the sound of the object on the screen is hard to capture, like footsteps or a burning cigarette 
or glasses clinking. So artists do this work later in the studio. Editors attach the sound to the image in post-production. Once I realized how much the sound of what we hear in film is created in post-production, it made me think about the power of sound. These natural sounds we find in our environment every day are essential to our experience. This summer, I traveled to Paris, France to focus solely on perception and everyday sounds. I participated in a summer program at the EarCam Sound Institute, where I was exposed to contemporary science and sound design and computer-enhanced musical performances. My intention was to learn better techniques and how to talk about sound and how to think about sound spatially. Over the summer, I was able to sit in on sound spatialization coding courses. At EarCam, the experiment with surround sound techniques, like how to manipulate the reverb of a noise through a combination of physics and computer programming to change the way the room sounds. By manipulating reverberation of sound, you can make a very small room appear audibly to be much larger or a larger room to appear smaller. Researching how sound moves in space and how sound can change the shape of a room, I thought as a filmmaker, I would like to create a soundscape of a fictional environment. I'm going to play for you an excerpt from the piece I call Creative Sound Geography. I collected sounds of Paris from different locations and times and added them together to give off the effect of one continuous walk through the streets. I want to explain the process of how I completed the sound piece. After collecting all of the sounds, when I came back to the States, I listened to all of the sounds and named them. I had collected about 60 sounds running from six seconds to 24 minutes in duration. I then categorized all of the sounds into three different groups, sound effects, voices, and what I call atmospheric sounds. Then I drew a sound map. I organized the map through a diagram of temporal structure of three categories based on how sound comes to you when you are moving through space. Two of the categories I refer to as flat temporal sounds. The first kind of flat temporal sound comes and goes far too fast for us to distinguish the sound dissipating in the distance. An example is a buzzing bee. In the second flat temporal sound, the change in volume is so slow or layered with other sounds that you don't notice the shift. These are the kind of sounds I refer to as atmospheric, general tones of a room or location. All locations have a bass sound in them, which is unique for every space. The second kind of temporal sound is a growing sound that has a clear shift in volume as you walk towards the emitting object and a decrease in volume when you walk away. The sound categorizes growing I learned to create by rerouting the volume of the sound into an arch form. It grows, hits a peak, and then falls away. If I place the sound of people singing, coming and going from us, I need there to be a bass atmosphere sound present in a constant volume or the sound will not appear as spatial. Also, you cannot just shift from one atmosphere to the next. You have to merge them or the change will sound very jarring. So why is the sound of an environment or space philosophically interesting? In my dissertation work, I focus on situated cognition. This is a philosophical position that argues our cognitive abilities is encapsulated in the environments we are in. I'm trying to lay out a philosophical understanding of how we experience sound in space and how our thoughts are situatedly embedded through the use of sound. I'm here to talk about how knowledge about time perception influences the music that I write. I'm mainly going to use my string quartet as an example. Time is a fascinating enigma. Though everything involves it, we often have a hard time defining and understanding it. 
In these ways, it is much like music in that it is hard to define and elusive to our understanding, despite its omnipresence in our lives. One of the great powers and mysteries of music is its ability to transcend chronometric time through what I like to call musical time or phenomenological time. The latter refers to time as we experience it. It's a subjective measurement of time, whereas the former is measured with a clock, if a little arbitrary. Time is also measured in beats and bars in music. And while it's not often articulated, many listeners are aware, even if only intuitively, that music affects our experience of time. So what then explains the gulf between chronometric time and musical time? Traditional theories of time tell us about an absolute objective time of Newtonian physics. Our vocabulary with regards to time is usually borrowed from the visual or spatial realms. For example, we speak of a grid of time or a point of time, and this is symptomatic of a lack of specificity in our approach to temporality. Time is not delineated by reaching time points or by crossing grid lines. It's delineated by perceived phenomena, and what constitutes a phenomenon depends largely, if not entirely, on context. And this is the next excerpt. Um, some of the things we can consider here are the essential differences and contextual matters of these two excerpts. Lorraine G. Allen's research shows that a densely filled interval of time is judged as longer than an empty interval of the same chronometric duration. It's a cognitive illusion in which a high level of stimulation stretches out one's perception of time to make it feel longer than it would have with fewer stimuli. If the presented oral stimulus is sufficiently dense, it can make time feel longer. A study carried out by James Corrales and Robert Kent shows that louder music is perceived as longer than quieter music. So consider how the second excerpt I have builds towards increasingly dense, increasingly dissonant, and increasingly loud music, thus raising the level's anticipation for what is to come next. As Robert Mead's research finds, time distorts and feels longer than its clock time as we approach the end of goal-oriented tasks. Anticipation thus elongates musical time, and anticipation is a normal part of human behavior. Our mind constantly wants to make connections to past and future events, which is why we tend to be most focused on and have a better recalling of what we perceive as being articulations of important beginnings and endings. There is also the contextual matter of the listener's own experience. One's own way of listening and perceiving plays a substantial impact on how they will hear and perceive the music, and indeed all events. Long-term memory acts as something like a filter determining which aspects of our environment we are aware of at a given time. Awareness of time makes phenomenological time feel longer, confirming the common saying that a watched pot never boils. One possible outcome of the manipulation of time is what I call hypnosis. While hypnosis for some may sound like some supernatural phenomenon, it is a normal part of human experience. For the purpose of this presentation, hypnosis will refer to a changed state of awareness that is characterized by improved focus and concentration. Noteworthy is the fact that people vary in their susceptibility to experiencing hypnosis, with some being unable to experience it at all. People also vary in terms of which stimuli make them more susceptible to hypnosis. Those who are hypnotizable exhibit higher levels of absorption in a task. For example, they become readily lost in a book or a film or music. Hypnosis has a special impact upon temporal judgment, making its subjects considerably underestimate the passage of chronometric time. It is not unusual for participants of hypnosis experiments to suggest as little as half the true duration. Now, the fact that the first excerpt starts out with a long-held note makes it so that there is a continuity while the note is present. This continuity persists over the strong articulations that occur at irregular intervals, which are hard to predict. While one may argue that the strong articulations disturb the continuity of the held note, they do not break it up. As Elizabeth Margulis explains, repeated exposures trigger an attentional shift from more local to more global levels of musical organization. Repetition thus can be understood to affect the listener's orientation toward the music. The horizon of involvement widens with additional exposures. This is one of the many complexities of discussing the phenomenology of perception. It is that the perception of an unchanging object may easily change. This remains the case as the object turns into a noma, that is, a mental object, because every time we revisit a memory, we change it slightly. 
Although chronometric time progresses steadily and inexorably in one direction, what is clear is that musical time is not as straightforward. Music is not the raw data which is written on paper, nor is it the performed sound waves. Rather, it is in the mind's interaction with this data and sound waves that create the music. It is often assumed that music occurs in time, as if time were some canister that contained events but was never influenced by them. I believe, however, that music is not in time, but time is in music.